On the border with China, a clock counts down the seconds left to the beginning of a whole new future for Hong Kong. Welcome to a spectacular view of Hong Kong, the city on everyone's lips, a city gearing up for the most important date in its history. Yes, on July 1st, 1997, 156 years of British rule comes to an end as Hong Kong once again becomes a part of China. So where better to be on the eve of the next chapter in Hong Kong's history? It's the gateway to the east, the hub of Asia, and to keep it that way, they're undertaking the most ambitious construction project of all time. Chek Lap Kok, Hong Kong's new airport. It's where Eastern wisdom is meeting Western science head on. Hong Kong scientists are putting traditional Chinese remedies under the microscope to sort out what's myth and what's medicine. And it's where making money is everything, so it's no surprise that someone would want to turn rubbish into diamonds. It's more of a surprise that they can. But first, we're on our way to the biggest building site on the planet. Down there is Chek Lap Kok, soon to be the world's largest airport. And it's all the more remarkable and controversial because to build it, they've demolished an entire island. Hong Kong's existing airport, Kai Tak, is famous for all the wrong reasons. It's completely overstretched, and pilots need special training to land there. This is the hairiest approach in the world. Pilots fly so low over the urban area of Kowloon that they can almost read the fake designer labels on the T-shirts drying on the washing lines. But in all this, where do you find space for a new airport? What Hong Kong has no shortage of is tiny, mountainous islands, but they're hardly ideal for building airports on. So they chose the uninhabited island of Chek Lap Kok and blew the top off. In the biggest land reclamation project of all time, they blasted, scraped, tipped and pumped millions of tons of rock and sand to make the platform for the airport. When they'd finished smearing it into the South China Sea, Chek Lap Kok was over four times as big. One small piece of the original island has been preserved, so you can get an idea of what it was like before they got to it. If you imagine hard enough, that is. For instance, the original shoreline used to be down at my feet. Now, it's about six kilometres over there. Somehow, I don't think this level of destruction of nature could ever happen in Britain. But then again, people here are prepared to make big sacrifices in the name of progress and prosperity. This is what they're aiming at. The biggest ever airport, with a terminal building over a kilometre in length. But as things stand at the moment, they've still a long way to go before reality catches up with the architect's vision. The architect here took a, a slightly different view, and that was that once you got into the building, albeit a very deep plan building, they wanted the passengers to be very much part of the flight experience they were about to embark on. And down either side, we've got uh, story height glazing, which gives you an immediate impact before you get onto the plane. They hope to be open by April 1998, one year behind the original schedule and not in time for the handover. 35 million people a year will be able to fly into the island of Chek Lap Kok. But building the airport was only half the problem. Getting people to and from central Hong Kong, 25 kilometers away, was the other half. To link remote island to chaotic mainland meant breaking another world record by building the longest ever road and rail suspension bridge. With a span of almost one and a half kilometers, the stunning Qing Ma Bridge will be Chek Lap Kok's lifeline to the rest of the world. Actually, it's high enough up here to start feeling quite queasy. 
There is no doubt that the whole airport project is a stupendous engineering achievement. But you know, there's more at stake here than just megabucks. It's no secret that a reclamation project this big will have a massive impact on the environment. Now, pollution will certainly increase as the flow of the bay is stifled. But one of the most contentious issues of this airport is that it's going to become the death sentence for a whole community of dolphins. Before work began in 1989, the water to the west of Hong Kong was home to the Chinese white dolphin. Numbers were estimated to be as high as 400. Now, there could be as few as 80. To protect the last few remaining dolphins, environmentalist Joe Ruxton is campaigning for a sanctuary, but is unhappy with the proposed location. Joe, where exactly are we now on this map? OK, we've got Hong Kong Island here, and what we've done is move all the way across. This is where the suspension bridge was, and then we came into the waters of northern Lantau and over to Lung Kwu Chow, and that's the island that we're moored beside now. Of course, this is where the proposed sanctuary is going to be, yeah? That's right. And this is the new airport site here. You can see the original outline of the island of Cheplak Kok, and all the rest of it is reclaimed. Since the project began, how much have the numbers depleted, do you think? It's difficult to say because they've not been studied before, so we had no idea of the size of the population. But what we have noticed is that the pod size is getting smaller and smaller, where before you would see... Uh, 20 dolphins together. Now, if you see them, it tends to be much smaller groups, sometimes on their own, maybe five. This proposed sanctuary, isn't that good in a way? I mean, isn't that going to offer them some sort of protection? In theory it is, yes. But in fact, if you look at what's happening in the area, they couldn't have chosen a worse place to establish a sanctuary. Why? Well, for a start, there's three main sewage outfalls going into the area, so water quality is bad and it's going to get worse. They're going to need to build an aviation fuel receiving facility right beside the southern island, and that will involve heavy machinery, dredging and maintenance dredging, and, of course, oil tankers coming into the area. The airport doesn't seem like the most environmentally friendly project on Earth, but is the Hong Kong government aware of all the issues? I think it will be a lot more environmentally friendly as an airport when it's finished. Uh, there won't be um, uh, tens, hundreds of thousands of people uh, living under the flight path. There are one or two environmental problems, including, as you've said, uh, the impact on the humpbacked dolphin, uh, about which not very much has been known in the past. Thanks, in fact, to what's happening, a great deal more will be known in the future because we're establishing uh, a marine sanctuary uh, and we're working with uh, the scientific community both here and in China to try to ensure that uh, the dolphins are rather better looked after. Look, there's one just behind oh, it look, now. Look there, there, just Lovely there. Pink one. Fantastic. Are they doomed? Is that it? Already the death rate is very high, and if it carries on at that level, then there's no doubt about it. We won't have them here anymore. In fact, Czech Lapcock Airport is just the beginning. Hong Kong has many more long-term plans to continue turning stretches of ocean into tarmac. So one thing's for sure, China will be getting back far more land than it lost back in 1841. When you can't be where the action is, don't deprive yourself of some of the fun. With the Royal Hong Kong Jockey Club's new wireless betting system, you can have a flutter wherever you are, right up to the very last second. Winning has never been easier. Then again, neither has losing. Designed in Hong Kong and made in China. Who are your tongue This morning, what color are your sputum? I didn't look, really. I, I didn't. <laughs> the remarkable thing about Hong Kong is that while the 41 hospitals here dispense modern medical care, just down the road, the traditional Chinese doctors continue to do brisk business with remedies that have changed little for thousands of years. But terrapin shell for skin allergies? Seahorses for tonsillitis and bringing your cholesterol level down? 
and gecko for impotence. Now you'd be forgiven for thinking this is all a lot of old cobblers. And you wouldn't be alone because a lot of scientists are also dismissive about all this. But come 1997, the Chinese want to make this huge body of folk medicine an integral part of healthcare here. Hong Kong scientists are putting it to the test in Chinese medicine's biggest shake-up for 4,000 years. The last 5,000 tigers in the world are being killed. All because some men believe that eating tiger penis will give them its legendary sexual prowess. Perhaps they, too, can make love for a full 15 seconds. Please, destroy the myth. Not the tiger. Despite its popularity, there is no scientific evidence to support the medicinal use of tiger parts. But what about other medicines? Well, ginseng is the most widely used of all of them. But Professor David Kwan thinks that here, too, popular wisdom has got it all wrong. There's been a lot of claims made about Chinese medicine. And some are fantasies and some are facts. Ginseng has been claimed to have anti-aging effect. It's been claimed to be good for hypertension and also good for diabetes. And it's up to us to find out which are the facts, which are the fantasies. Millions of pounds of ginseng is sold in Hong Kong every year. Traditionally, it's taken in soup. Uh, there are two main types of ginseng. One is North American ginseng, and the other is Oriental ginseng. And North American ginseng is far more expensive than the oriental ginseng. In Hong Kong, people believe both types help heart disease, but Professor Kwan's experiments showed otherwise. He examined the effect of ginseng on tiny blood vessels taken from rats. The expense of North American ginseng caused a slight contraction in the vessels. However, the oriental ginseng caused the vessels to dilate dramatically, indicating opposite health effects. People generally assume that uh, the more expensive one must be better, but it's not necessarily the case. In North American ginseng, even though it's very expensive, that might not be good for the heart. While the Korean ginseng is cheaper, maybe better for the heart diseases. This insight into just one herb took Dr. Kwan several years. How can science tackle all 5,000 different ingredients in the ancient literature? It's a phenomenal task, but at Hong Kong's Chinese Medicinal Research Center, they've collected thousands of ingredients from human placenta to urine sediment. And one by one, they're putting the claims of traditional medicine under scientific scrutiny. People are using it, and they're happy with it, but there is very little scientific support or documentation or proof to tell us why and how it works. And here, we have to bring in scientific methods, new technology, new instruments to help document the value of Chinese medicine. Already, they have some interesting findings. In Chinese medicine, it's thought that rhino horn relieves fever. Their work on confiscated samples has shown that indeed it does. But the good news, for the rhino at least, is that cattle horn works just as well. And preliminary evidence shows that a root called trichosanthin has a role in the treatment of AIDS, where Western medicine is still desperate for answers. Information like this will indicate how much traditional remedies can offer Western medicine in the future. But already, one doctor is bringing the two together. Dr. Xu treats his cancer patients with conventional chemotherapy. But at the same time, they're receiving an extract from the Yongzhi mushroom, a mainstay of Chinese medicine. They now know that the mushroom reduces the side effects of chemotherapy, making for a combined medicine better than either alone. It's worth remembering that drugs can and do come from the unlikeliest of sources. AZT was extracted from the semen of salmon. But the big question is, do they work? Here in Hong Kong, if traditional remedies are to become part of modern medicine, then it's up to science to figure out fact from fiction.